I would like to just let the last song be the introduction to the introduction to my sermon. We all, with gusto and properly so, and I hope from the heart, saying salvation has been brought down, has been past tense. It's already come. Salvation from what? Well, it can't be salvation in heaven. It has to be salvation from sin. Saved from our sin. That song presupposes that we know from the Bible that it's Jesus Christ who saves us from our sins. It also presupposes that we understand that sin is the transgression of the law, 1 John 3, 4. And that all have transgressed the law and come short of the glory of God, thus in need of salvation. Romans 3, 23 and Romans 6, 23. But it's not just enough to know salvation's been brought down. Forgiveness of sins is available. We must be asking, well, how can I partake of this which has been brought down? Namely, forgiveness of sins. Salvation. Jesus declared, as I think all of us know, in John 14, verse 6, that he is the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by him. How do I come to the Father? By him. Well, what does that mean? By him. Well, none of these things I've mentioned, and that song could not have even been written, except that somebody has some knowledge of the Bible that pertains to the very things that the song was about. And if we're to sing it in spirit and in truth, if we're to sing it teaching one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in our heart as we are to do, Ephesians 5, 19, Colossians 3, 16, then we have to have some education, biblical education, to understand what that salvation is. Again, it's quite amazing for those who have been brought up in homes where the Bible was studied and exposed to the pure primitive preaching of the gospel of Christ, how much of that we take for granted. I'm reminded of the, to illustrate this further, of the old tale that was told of the two very zealous young missionaries. And I say young because they were Young, <laughs> and they had the characteristics sometimes of what youth has. And they went into the mountains years ago. They were going to take the gospel to the people there. And the first one they came up on was an old man sitting on the front porch. And so they ask him the question, trying to get some sort of conversation started so they could lead into what they wanted to do, and that is teach him. And they said, uh, are you lost? The old man with consternation and wonder looked back at them and said, no, I'm not lost. I was born and raised and lived all my life around here. I know where I am. Well, they thought they would try it again. Are you a Christian? The man knitted his eyebrows together and looked at him and said, No, I'm Mr. Black. Mr. Christian lives down the road, such and such a place. Well, that was, of course, frustrating the young preachers. So they said, Well, are you ready for the judgment? He looked at them amazed again and said uh, when is that coming and they said well it could be today it could be tomorrow the man said well don't tell my wife she'll want to go both days sometimes we have to understand that people whom we assume and that's a bad assumption understand the terms we use 
but they don't. Now, that might not have been so much the case years ago, but that story I told was told by a preacher who was a whole lot older than me when I was a, a young person. So I know they had problems with things even then. Nowadays, I promise you, we have a lot worse problems. And the sad part about it is, when you see the church leaving the old paths, leaving the proper knowledge of the truth, leaving terms of Scripture that we used to assume everybody knew and knew the meaning of them, but they don't. If people would answer you honestly, I think it would be a good question to ask. Members of the Church of Christ, and this would vary from congregation to congregation, members of the Church of Christ, where did the Church of Christ come from? I think you'd be set back on your heels if you're informed yourself as you ought to be from the Scriptures as to the starting, the beginning of the Church of Christ. If you were to ask about their view of the Scriptures, where did the Bible come from? Especially, where did the New Testament come from? What is a testament? Why is half the Bible called, or say half the Bible, part of it called the Old Testament? Next part, New Testament. Why do some people call it New Testament and others call it New Covenant? Our Old Covenant and Old Testament. Can I go to the book of Leviticus and learn what to do to become a Christian? Straight from that book, consulting no other. Can I learn about the church? All I need to know about it. From the book of Amos? And if I can't, why? Basically, in recent years, we've simply fallen down flat in lots of places. To understand 2 Timothy 2.15, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needed not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. The hungering and thirsting after righteousness must be a part of you before you will be studious. Before you'll realize, before you will realize that there's a wrong division of the word, there's a right division. It'd be ridiculous to say, just divide it any way you want to, but he didn't. He said right division. So I have to learn what the right division of the word is. My own brethren don't understand much about that. I've noticed this over the years out of my personal experience, especially when I got into teaching in preacher school. So many people in the church want to be able to, those that, I mean, among those who actually want to try to learn to stand up and speak before an audience to teach them something. It's next, well, I won't say it that strongly. It starts it was next to impossible. I won't say it that strongly. But it's difficult to get a lot of those preachers just starting out, wanting, want to be preachers, I call them. And I don't mean those that we think of going into full-time work like I've done all my life. But I mean anybody wanting to be able to fill in when they needed to or to speak well and communicate and get points across that need to be understood. Many of them wouldn't want to deal with the fundamentals in preparing their sermons. They wanted to get off over here on something might be needful, but it usually had to do with more meaty matters. And the thing I try my best, I tried my best to do then, and I would now and still do. You need to make sure that the people know the first principles and fundamentals. Because all of this meaty matter is not going to be worth anything if they don't understand and grasp the first principles and fundamentals. And folks, they don't. 
Anybody today who's been associated with the church and finally members of it, as far as we can tell from our view of outward appearances, don't know that the church didn't come from Roman Catholicism. Somebody has sadly not only dropped the ball, but they've let all the air out of it. We quote all we want to from the Old Testament about God's people of that day. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. That becomes just something that preachers tell us, and we know it means we ought to study the Bible. But then begin to ask questions. You know, my people, and I say my people, I mean my family in Christ, do not like to be asked specific questions. We love generalizations. I'll give you an example. I don't ask for a show of hands now, but how many of you are daily Bible readers? I'm not saying you've got to read a whole book, <laughs> but how many of you are daily Bible readers? You don't want to listen to your father speak to you every day? So it becomes a problem with all of us to remind ourselves that out of all the stuff going on every day, all day long, surely there ought to be some time that we want to listen to our Father. Do we respect the authority of Jesus Christ as manifest in the words of the Bible? You see this quotation that's above my head on the wall. Whatsoever you do in word or in deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father thereby. Colossians 3.17. Why is that there? Why do we quote it? What did Paul meant when he wrote it to the Colossians? You act only as you have authorization from your king to act. You can't have faith in that which is not written, for faith comes by hearing the word of God, Romans 10, 17. And you know, that presupposes that's a rightly divided word of God, 2 Timothy 2, 15. The authority is in the scriptures. I can't know anything about Christianity like I need to know it if I don't study the book that is the primary and only infallible source to learn about salvation has been brought down. How it was brought down, how I contacted, what does salvation mean? So when you find members of the church who or haphazard in their attendance, who are very capable in their everyday life seemingly to run their affairs. They do have the ability to pay attention because they do. They can keep their checkbooks hopefully straight and pay their monthly bills. I guarantee you they'll, they'll pay their electric bill if they can't pay anything else this day and age. Right now, you won't forget because you don't want your power turned off right now. Well, the gospel is the power of God and salvation. You want it turned off. It's not hard to turn the gospel off as the power of God, not that you get rid of it in the sense of getting rid of the Bible. But you just don't expose yourself to it. You don't choose to be involved with it. You don't study it. How can you understand the Lord's church? Another question, are there... Faithful Christians in any and every church. Well, what's going on in your mind right now? I'm not going to ask you how many believe there are faithful Christians. Show of hands. How many believe there are faithful Christians in all churches? Well, I think you'd be surprised. How many members of the church think that way? My question is, you know, if I really believe that the people could, could be faithful to the Lord, enjoy the salvation only he brings in any church, I don't know why I'd want to be a member of this one. In fact, what I would try to do if I wanted to, if I really believed that, i just visit all of them. Some, each one of them may have something to offer. i just go around. Why, why? You know why we do? Creatures have it. Comfortable. We like the way things are done. We can anticipate this. I know when to go to sleep, when to whatever. Can I get more fundamental? If I can get more fundamental and basic, will you tell me how to do it? These things 
are necessary for any growth and develop so you'll be ca- development so you can be capable of handling the more meaty matters. When you don't bring your life into subjection to what you know the Bible says, let me give you an example. Now, this is one of those questions nobody wants to ask, or at least most don't. You're contributing of your financial means. Does the Lord know what you give? Yes, he does. Should the church be able to depend upon your giving cheerfully without grudging and that you're really from the heart giving of your financial means as you have really been prospered? What do you spend your money on? What do you put first? That's what I'm talking about. Can you get more fundamental than that? You can't get more fundamental than that. But if you don't practice the truth that God intends to practice, you can't grow. You don't become sharply aware of things. You may talk a good show. What do you do? Or maybe we should say, what have I left undone? Sin of omission. To him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, James says, to him it is sin. We hear a lot today about our priorities, what comes first. And we quote, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things should be added to you. I don't think a lot of members of the church really believe that. Because they put so many other things first. Now moving on into what's wrong. By the way, this can be preached in every generation. It may be more needful sometimes than others. But what I'm preaching here needs to be preached all the time. The seed is the word of God. What seed? The seed of the kingdom, Luke 8, 11. That seed being the word of God thus contains these first principles and these fundamentals. If somebody were to ask you, well, you sang this morning salvation has been brought down. What do you mean by salvation? Could you explain it? Brought down. Somebody brought something down. What was it? Salvation. Down from where? <coughs> Who brought it? How do I access Jesus to save me? Do I have any real consciousness of my sins? And what the Bible says sin is and how God views sin. Do I realize that when I die guilty of sin, the only place I can go in eternity and be there forever is a fiery hell? Do I understand that? There's no place in between. It's heaven or hell after the day of judgment. Heaven or hell. Am I doing now what will keep me out of hell? What will guarantee me to be pleasing to God and I get into heaven. I don't care whether we number, number 500 or we number 5. These things need to be preached. They need to be understood. We don't need to guess, as many do, give them lip service. Well, that's right. When I quit today, I doubt anybody will say, you preach false doctrine. You stated lies. But you see, sometimes we might as well say that because we're not going to do it. Do we believe we can be stubborn against the truth? Yeah, I do. Just like I can be stubborn for the truth. I won't accept anything but the truth. I'm going to be moved off of it. When I think of the people, us as members of the church, what is necessary to keep the church the Lord's church? I don't want it to be my church. I don't want it to be your church. I want it to be the Lord's church, and I want him to be happy. If if it's the Lord's church, then those members who make it up, Christians, they're of Christ. They are laboring to know their Lord's will and to discharge it. And they're always trying to grow and to develop. And they're not running 
from things they know that they're not doing that are right. So do they have the proper attitude toward the authority of the scriptures and the need that they have to know those scriptures and to know them rightly divided and to understand the first principles of the church? Could you explain to somebody without opening up the Bible and having to study for a week, could you explain to somebody the first principles of salvation and the identifying marks of the church? Now, this would be one of the things I found out that some of these younger preachers or people just starting out, you, it would be hard to get them to talk about the founder of the church, the organization of the church, the elders and their qualifications and their work, the deacons and their qualifications and their work. If you just left it up to them, so many of them would pick out sermons that, not that they're wrong, but they pick them out and preach them when they're not even yet ready to preach the fundamentals and first principles. I found that out pretty quick after I got involved in preacher training. I don't know why, but I've noticed it and kept mental record of it for years. It's the way it works. We must realize that for the first three centuries, after the Lord's church was established. They had no man-made creeds. There were no councils that wrote out creeds that said, here's what we believe. Apostasy was taking place, as had been predicted by Paul in 1 Timothy 4, 1 and 2. People were moving further away from the truth. That's true. And they couldn't move away from what they didn't know, embrace, and then depart from it. 1 Timothy 4 and 1. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in latter time some shall depart from the faith. Okay, let's just stop right there. They couldn't leave what they were not a part of. They had to have heard the gospel, believed it, and obeyed it, were added to the church by the Lord. Now, if you read the rest of the verses following what I, where I stopped, you'll see how they did it. They became interested in other things that became more important to them than to walk according to the authority of their Lord. Giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of demons, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared as with a hot iron. They resisted the truth. They practiced that which they knew the Bible taught. Oh, they may have said that was a fine sermon, then gone ahead and gone and did as they pleased, contrary to what they were taught. That's the way it works. People could not apostatize if they weren't, were not a part of the thing. You can't get off of a boat if you weren't on it in the first place. And the ark of safety today is the Lord's church. <laughs> the identifying marks of which are found in the New Testament. Could you explain today why faithful members of the Lord's church partake of the Lord's Supper only on the first day of the week in the assemblies of the saints? Could you explain why? I think you'd be surprised if people couldn't explain why. They could tell you we did it. They might cite Acts 20 and 7 as an example of it, but let them try to explain to you why that's an example. Because they did meet in the third story. At night, where there were many lights, and they broke bread. Why do we select one of those and let the others go? As a pattern or an example for us to follow. You have to know. It's all involved in ascertaining Bible authority. Which means you have to know how the Bible authorizes. Which means you have to rightly divide the word of truth. Could we explain that to people? I know that people could explain it because we had so many people at one time when the whole country was closer to the Bible as God's word and believed they must have it behind what they believed because they did. More and more people followed it. When the church begins to lose numbers, you know people more and more 
are not believing in God according to the scriptures nor respecting the authority of the scriptures. Of course today we have people all around us that we would like to see converted and we know it's harder to convert them because they're further than ever away from God and away from the Bible as the very word of God and the authoritative power of it. So it makes it hard to convert people. I understand that. Well, then how do you explain, besides death, how do you explain the church losing members? They cease to believe. The Bible have anything to say about people believing and then ceasing to believe? Of course it does. Our young people, our parents teaching them, are they expecting them to get all of it strictly from the pulpit or the classroom here? I think you'll be surprised if you ask the young people about some of these fundamental matters. How little they really know. Because you see, a lot of times they're walking on their parents' faith because they're under the jurisdiction and control of their parents. Therefore, they continue as long as mom and daddy are there. But let them get out on their own, they find their newfound freedom. Mom and daddy's not there to tell us anymore what to do. Whoopee! If I don't want to go to church, nobody's there to tell me I have to. And you say, well, weren't they baptized? Yes. Don't they have faith in God? Very little. They've been going on what mom and daddy told them to do and not any, through any personal faith in the conviction arising therefrom in their own study. That's been around a long time. Here's the way classes have gone at times. At least it was when I grew up. Not all, but some and too many. You have a little book, as it used to be, and at the end of each lesson, there were questions to fill in. You go in class, you covered lesson 12 last week, we go lesson 13 this week. We get over here, we open it. it you don't have much time, so rarely do they read through that lesson in class. Sometimes, maybe. But most of the time, you go back to the end of the book. Jane, you take question one, and we'll go down the road. How do you spell Bible? Well, Jane says, B-I-B-L-E. And you go to Bob, and you say, Bob, next question. How many books in the New Testament? Bob says, 27. I'm not faulting the answers. I'm saying that's not teaching. I'm saying you have to teach. You know there's no learning where there's not any teaching, or maybe I should say there's no teaching where there's not any learning. It's just the way it works. How can you say you've taught someone when that person doesn't know what you said? I don't care if he's in class or not. And frankly, I've been in classes all the way up through college and graduate school to where I sat through the class and I didn't learn anything. Especially <laughs> a couple of courses on statistics. I don't know why anybody would care about learning statistics. And come to find out, both teachers I had were about one day ahead of me. One of them even got up and said, I'm about one day ahead of y'all in this class. I didn't know I was going to have to teach it. And I, they, they just hired us in the summer at Oklahoma State University. And they just hired this woman from, from north, I don't know what this northeast university in Texas is called, but up there. And she had moved there. She told I'm about one day ahead of y'all on this. Well, you might say, well, not think that much about that. What about the church? How much ahead of the students or the people standing in class teaching? Well, I can tell you, if it hadn't been for books where you fill in, the, fill in the blanks, some of those teachers wouldn't know what to do. They had to fill in the blank. Properly used, of course, you can learn from those kind of books. But listen, this is not across the board completely, but in general, it's pretty true. You can fill in the blanks to questions till the Lord comes back again, and that's a thousand years of the future, if it is. And you won't learn a thing. 
You've got to have your heart into it. You've got to want to know it. And I can remember very well as a teenager when I finally got my mind geared up to where I want to know this. I want to be what I need to be and ought to be, and I can't be without knowing this. Changed my whole outlook on going to class. So what are we saying? What is this lesson all about? Because you know I can add a lot more to it. That's first principle and fundamental. Don't get far away with the fundamentals. They have to be taught to every generation. You take these little ones. Now, we've heard some of this. Some people have a long, long time. But it's new to them. Take a person that just comes for a visit out of a denominational background. It's new to them. And we've got to keep that in mind as we try to grow and develop ourselves. Do we, would we say that everybody in this room this morning, and I'll just simply do it this way, that's an adult, is at the same position of knowledge, same amount of knowledge of the truth of God's good word in every one of us? Could we show somebody what the church is just by taking our Bible right now and start showing it to them? Could we show them even why the plan of salvation? I, I wish we had people coming all the time that didn't have these things in their minds and they'd walk up to each one of us and say, why, why did you do this? What is the Lord's Supper business? Why this, why that? Where's the piano? Where's the organ? Where's the whatever in the way of mechanical instruments or music? Could we show them and tell them why? And on and on we could go. So you can see this is a what I call a reminder sermon. Because I know people here at different degrees of knowledge and understanding. And some need this far, far more than others. But I know the young people need to have these things drilled into them. If I were to ask, I'm going to close on this one. If I were to ask, if we use mechanical instrumental music in our singing as we worship God, is that sin that will cause a person to lose their soul? Did you find yourself saying, I don't know whether I want to say yes to that or not. Red flags ought to be flying up all over the place. That's what happens. And that's true of every other obligatory matter set out in the gospel for Christians. Well, I close now, hopefully made my point clear concerning how the Bible furnishes us into every good work. But it won't unless we learn it. If you're not a Christian, then of course you must be brought to believe in Christ with such a belief and trust that it leads you to take him at his word, comply with the rest of the plan of salvation, in repenting of sins, confessing one's faith in Christ, and being baptized for the remission of sins. As a child of God, where are we? What are we doing? Not just right now. What are we doing tomorrow, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, in our everyday activities? When do we study our Bible? When do we pray? We need to remind ourselves of these things. Every one of us must, if we're to be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. If you're subject to the Lord's invitation to those members of the church who need to repent, we ask you to do that and confess those sins, pray God for forgiveness. If you're subject then to the Lord's invitation, come while we stand and while we sing.